Good afternoon to all those attending in our local time zone. And good morning, good evening to everyone else tuning in from abroad. During these hard times that Lebanon is passing through, the Mentoring Talk series has always aimed at providing a glimmer of hope to our youth. We carry on this hope by showing them that it is completely fine to encounter repeated defeat on the way to the ultimate success. Keep on beginning and failing, says Anna Sullivan, teacher and lifelong friend to Helen Keller, who said, each time you fail, start all over again, and you will grow stronger until you have accomplished a purpose. Not the one you began with, perhaps, but one you will be glad to remember. With this, I would like to welcome you all to the 19th edition of our Mentoring Talk series, specifically to the 7th edition of the virtual lectureship broadcasted via WebEx. I am truly thrilled to welcome the Canadian Chief Science Advisor, Lebanese-born Professor Muna Nimr for today's Mentoring Talk. Professor Nimr is renowned for her exceptional work in molecular genetics and cardiac regeneration. She has published more than 150 articles in prestigious journals, as well as making distinguished contributions to the development of diagnostic tests for heart failure and the genetics of cardiac birth defects. Her influential scientific discoveries and articles, as well as her substantial teaching career have made her a real inspiration to many students around the world. Not only has Professor Nimmer achieved many scholarly accolades, but she has also demonstrated a strong commitment to the education of the up and coming generations. She does this by supervising graduate students and postgraduates globally, encompassing more than 100 student mentees from all over the world. In addition to her individual achievements, Professor Nimmer has also, has also stood up repeatedly on behalf of those who are underrepresented, particularly women. In her own words, quote, I think that we will rest on the day when it is so normal that nobody walks up to any woman in a leadership position and says how great it is because I don't think any guy walks up to a prime minister or a president and says, oh, isn't it wonderful that we have a white man who is a leader? End of quote. In her capacity as a chief science advisor to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Professor Nimmer has been guiding Canada successfully through the COVID-19 pandemic. Like many great Lebanese achievers, Lost to the brain drain, Professor Nimmer was born in Lebanon, but had to leave her homeland at the outbreak of, of the Civil War. In fact, Professor Nimmer started her undergraduate studies in chemistry right here at AUB in October 1974. She actually took the Organic Chemistry 1 course, Chemistry 211, it was back then called Chemistry 211, it is still called Chemistry 211, with my colleague, Professor Makhlouf Haddadin, whom many of you may know. In September 1976, she transferred to Wichita State University due to the civil strife. As a young girl, Muna always dreamt of a career in science. She was drawn towards the medical field, but did not want to become a medical doctor whose area of influence only exists on the small scale, according to her. Instead, she wanted to discover new drugs and techniques that could potentially save the lives of millions of human beings around the world. Seeing as her work was integral to the field of molecular cardiology, one can happily say she has achieved that childhood dream with flying colors. Taking all her achievements in summary, it is clear to see 
Professor Nimr stands as the role model for women in STEM and beyond. Without further ado, it is truly my distinguished honor to present to you Professor Muna Nimr, to whom I humbly leave the floor. Welcome home, Professor Nimr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear, dear colleague, for this very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to make sure that my daughter and my entire family actually watches uh, your, your presentation. I don't think they will recognize me. That was too And uh, uh, more specifically on the AUB campus, it's, it's always uh, great to participate in, in events of uh, the place where I really started um, my, uh, my training, uh, my career, and where I really um, actually dreamt uh, to be back and, uh, and contribute as well. But you never know, right, how life uh, takes you. Um, you were, you're very kind of uh, talking about my successes, but as you have instructed me, I am here to talk about as well failures and mistakes. As a matter of fact, uh, many chemistry uh, colleagues would consider me a failure. Uh, after all, I'm not doing chemistry, as you kindly mentioned, and I am not a professor of chemistry. I'm not a, a, a chemistry you know, leader in any industry. So I'm saying this just to illustrate a little bit the theme of my, my talk, which will be, you know, around the perspectives of failures and mistakes. Of course, when we think of, of failures, we think of failed experiments, we think of a failed company we started, of a failed move we did. And I've certainly had my shares uh, of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, my um, a very interesting chemistry PhD, which uh, dealt with RNA synthesis. Uh, the, the more uh, important uh, aspects of it were due to a failed experiment. But, you know, I got a product that I wasn't supposed to get. Instead of throwing it, I just kept it and I thought about it every other day what it could be. And then I figured one day what it could be, and it turned out to be an intermediate that people thought before could not exist. But I had been staring at it for many months, so for sure it could exist. But that intermediate, you know, allowed me to do many other uh, products and contributed in a great way to the automation of DNA and RNA synthesis. So that was certainly a failure that I, uh, recovered uh, from. But I don't want necessarily to talk about those kinds of failure. I want to give the perspective of what we consider as failures and what we consider as, as mistakes. Because there are clearly societal and cultural norms and uh, expectations. So we're programmed in certain uh, ways to achieve certain things. And if we don't achieve them, then we view this and others may view this as well as failures or as mistakes. And um, certainly in the academic field, I think we have lots of biases and we have lots of preconceived ideas about what uh, success is and what failure uh, is. And one of the things that I have been trying uh, to do for some time now is to explain to um, science graduates that if you don't continue your career in science, if you decide to take on any job in journalism, become a lawyer, uh, work in a bank, uh, completely deviate, this is not a mistake because actually your training has equipped you with competences that you don't think about perhaps, but you're going to use and that you're going to practice every day in just so many different areas of life. But for some, it may be viewed as a failure that you didn't stay in the field where you studied. And that's certainly been, in a way, my case. I ended up in a field which was not my chosen field, the one where I wanted to thrive. But I hope to convince you that I nonetheless managed to make uh, in interesting contributions, including even to the field where I have failed. 
So I've certainly had an unconventional, I would say, uh, career path. And um, many women and many minorities actually have uh, unusual career path because after all, usual has been determined by the ruling majority in many ways. And I think there are so many stories of successes, actually so many stories of Nobel Prize winners in different fields that have come from a completely uh, uh, a different field from the one they, they ended up making contributions to. And I think that this is, um, you know, it, it sort of um, shows you how much biases we carry with us uh, and we inherit and that these limit us rather than help us necessarily in life. So I've certainly made choices that have been viewed by some as, as mistakes uh, or failure. Uh, but I can uh, tell you today that these choices uh, were instrumental uh, in, in my career, were instru instrumental in my um, professional fulfillment and in my ability to contribute beyond actually what I thought I could uh, contribute. So let me focus perhaps on two aspects of, of my careers uh, and, you know, relate perhaps some anecdotes to illustrate some of, um, you know, what were perceived or what were uh, or not mistakes and, and failures. So as you kindly mentioned, um, I was trained in chemistry. It, it, it was my uh, dream to uh, to do drug discovery and uh, and contribute uh, to making uh, a better health for for the entire world. So um, during my uh, I had a I think what can be considered a successful uh, PhD uh, career where uh, I, I think uh, contributed innovative ways to RNA synthesis to uh, many. Um, um, uh, nucleoside analogs, some of them ended up being uh, important uh, antiviral or anti-cancer. Uh, but at the end of my uh, PhD uh, studies, uh, in spite of having a dozen uh, publications in great journals, I decided that I wasn't going to pursue an academic career. I, I wasn't going to do a postdoc. Uh, I turned down a faculty position actually at the great Johns Hopkins University. And I decided to go into industry, uh, the biotech industry at the time, which was just like starting uh, and very interesting. And when I tell the story, of course, considering that I spent the, the major, the, the enti my entire career in academia, no one can believe that actually I did that move. But I did it and I sure don't regret it. Although it was viewed as a mistake by my mentor, it was viewed by as a mistake by my enti the entire chemistry department at McGill University. After all, one of their star PhD students was sort of ending up in industry instead of being a, a faculty or a, a, a having a postdoctoral position at a prestigious institution. So first failure or mistake, if you want. Well, after a year of being at the at the at the company, uh, I actually didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like being a service department anyway, and um, I went back to do a postdoc. So second failure. Well, I learned a lot actually. I I learned quite a lot. Um, I'm I'm probably one of the few academics that experienced. Um, uh, industry, the demands of industry, what it's like and so on, and could actually help my students later on. And when I was in a position, uh, for example, as the vice president of research at the University of Ottawa, I knew how to deal with industry and I knew how to help researchers as well deal with industry. So nonetheless, second mistake, second failure. Then I decide I'm going to, to I have to learn some more biology. I realized I needed to do uh, to understand a little bit more biology and physiology if I'm really going to be doing drug discovery and not just being the sort of service chemist and having others tell me, you know, what would be interesting. When I decided to do a, a postdoc in biology, I was actually, I had a, a nice chat with the chair of the chemistry department who again told me, 
no, no, you're good enough as a chemist. You don't have to go into biology. So that tells you that that was viewed again as a failure and as a mistake. Well, I don't regret a minute having done postdocs in molecular biology. Uh, I learned uh, a lot. It was always my intention to go back and do drug discovery. I didn't know what was what was going to be the path uh, to it. It ended up being a long, complicated path, but I did end up in it. And I think I was a better researcher and scientist doing this because of both my training as a chemist and my training as a molecular uh, biologist. So then to finish my training, um, the last mistake, if you want, that I did was to deviate from my main project, which was about the cloning of a brain uh, gene and working on the brain. And it was a very fortuitous uh, event because in the institute where I was, uh, some physiologists were working on a new hormone that they extracted from the heart called atrial natriuretic peptide. And they asked me whether I would help them and accept to collaborate and clone uh, the gene for, uh, for uh, ANF. Well, at the time, there were very few of us cloners, if you want, molecular biologists who could do this. And I, I agreed to do it because I thought it would be a shame if your, the, your next door uh, colleague would not help you and you, ha you have to go outside to get this done. So I made a deal with my supervisor, I'll do this and then go back to my main project. Well, guess what? I never went back to my, my main project. After I cloned ANF, uh, I was fascinated by this hormone coming out of the heart, of the idea that the heart would be an endocrine organ, not just a pump. Um, this is from someone who had not studied biology. The first time that I actually had to look for the heart during dissection, I mistaken it for the liver had it not been beating. Um, so I certainly was not uh, equipped to have any sort of career in what, you know, became known later on as molecular cardiology. So, you know, this is my, this was my, my training. You could say it's a succession of fortuitous event, a succession of, uh, you know, interesting happenings, but many can see it as also a succession of failures and, and mistakes. So. Fast forward to my to my career. Then I decide to then start working on the heart. If you had told me in when I was at AUB on the AUB campus, not wanting to have anything to do with biology, that my the rest of my career will be on the heart, I would have asked you, you know, what had you been smoking or drinking that day? Well, there it is. I ended up doing molecular cardiology. I was a total outsider and I had no preconceived idea on, how, you know, what, what the, the cardiac genes, you know, should look like, uh, that the heart should resemble skeletal muscle. So therefore I should look for skeletal muscle knowledge and, you know, transfer it to the heart. Turns out people had been doing this for years uh, with zero success. Well, I didn't have any of those preconceived notions. I did what you know, needed to, to, to be, to be done. Uh, I had around me people who were in hematology and in immunology, and uh, I didn't see why actually the heart wouldn't be closer uh, to the vessels and to blood cells. You know, it turned out actually they were, uh, embryologically they were, but people working on the heart at the time came from skeletal muscle and they just saw the heart as a muscle. So, because I didn't have any of these preconceived idea, I ended up asking trivial questions, perhaps for people who were in the field, like, why is it that one part of the heart, the atria, does one thing that's different from the ventricles? Well, that question led actually to the finding that ANF that was expressed in the atria became upregulated in the ventricles when the heart was under stress. Uh, when we, when the heart went into heart failure, and that's what, uh, was the basis for, um, for a lot of diagnostic tests around natriuretic peptide hormones as diagnostics 
and prognostics uh, for heart failure. So that came from someone who had never taken a biology class, who didn't do certainly any cardiology in, the, in, in her life. Well, after that, uh, when I started looking naively for the genes that, you know, are necessary to turn on uh, ANF specifically in, in the heart, again, I didn't try to, you know, extrapolate from skeletal muscle. And I ended up making a very important discovery uh, that uh, a protein named GATA4 was actually essential for the heart. And through collaborations, uh, including with uh, colleagues at uh, the American University of Beirut, we found that mutations in GATA4 actually lead to congenital heart disease. So again, this is, uh, you know, no, no, uh, no biases, no preconceived ideas. You just, you know, carry on. Well, guess what? Great papers, great discoveries, and so on. Then I decide to go into administration while still doing my, my research. Well, question is, what's going on? Uh, back then in the 90s, you went into, you were recycled into administration if you were a failed professor, if you were, were a failed researcher, which I guess I wasn't. Well, why did I go into administration? I went into administration because I was tired of seeing things happening not the way I like them. And I was tired of just complaining about it, of being basically in the opposition. Uh, I think as, as, uh, as researchers and as academics, we, we love being in the opposition. We hate what the administration is doing. We always you know, sort of uh, criticize them. Well, I decided that I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do something about it. And I think there, you know, a, a lot of the things that I had uh, learned in, in Lebanon to be a go-getter, uh, not, not to wait for others maybe to, you know, do things for you. Um, even as one of the very few um, or uh, PhD uh, female chemists in, uh, uh, you know, at the time at, at McGill, uh, I had to fight to have access to the bathroom on the same floor as my lab because they were all four guys. The only bathroom for, for women were in the basement because this is where the undergraduate labs were. So all this to say that maybe it was my personality that I just decided that it's time to do something about it. And I thought that actually you needed to be a successful uh, researcher and a successful uh, research professor uh, to know what it takes in terms of administration uh, to, to be an, an enabler, to facilitate uh, the work of researchers and of scientists. So this is how I started in, a, in the small institute where I was. Uh, I became academic uh, director and I helped uh, make sure that students had, you know, proper men men mentorship, uh, uh, what they needed to do their their experiments, uh, put in place core facilities for everyone. Uh, at the time, it was viewed also by many as a mistake for me to stay at the institute where I trained as a postdoc, and the, there was no shortages of of offers to have a position at a you know larger uh, university. I didn't do it because I just like didn't think it was really important where I was as long as I was doing you know, what I enjoyed doing, which was um, my research. I was very well set up, but, but also I learned a, a lot. It's like being in a small business. You learn to do, to wash, to wash the dishes. You, you wash the windows, you do accounting, you do marketing, you do all these things. And in many ways, that's what happened to me in, in, a, in the small setting. I was exposed to, to all these different areas from human resource management to the finance, to actually dealing with politicians, to lobbying for more funding, etc., and that definitely, uh, actually, you know, positioned me well to have a a, a position in a larger um, institution, actually in one of the leading universities in Canada, where I was um, a VP research for eleven years, and again, it was this notion that 
I, I wanted to give back. I wanted to make the place a better place. And I definitely had a passion, you know, for science and research and, and wanted to do everything uh, I can uh, to enable better research and, and better uh, training. So I think that uh, I guess my credibility, both as a, a scientist and as a res and as an administrator and an academic leader was instrumental in the job that I do right now, which is to advise uh, the, the government of Canada, the prime minister on science in the midst of the, you know, the greatest pandemic that we've had in over 100 years. So bottom line, don't let others define you. Uh, be yourself, um, always be yourself for better or worse. Uh, but also take risks, get out of your comfort zones, be willing to learn, be willing to fail, be willing, you know, to be told that that was not the right move. I think it's also very important to keep your options open. Um, right now, um, I, ha I am on, on leave from the university. Uh, if I, you know, I took a job, uh, I was the, the first in many years, a chief science advisor in Canada. I didn't really know what the job was like. Um, I was shaping it. I was actually designing the plane as we were flying. And then of course, uh, even more so during a pandemic. But I think it's, uh, it's all these uh, past mistakes and successes that actually equip you to have the confidence to know that you will carry on. But, you know, knowing that I may not like it, I could always go back. To the university so my options were again uh, open because i had just like you know multitude of maybe competences and and uh, just like an open mind to embrace many things and then i think the most important thing i would like to leave with the with the students is don't over plan your life you never know um you know what's ahead of you uh Take the most advantage of the moment. Um, you may not be in the field that you love. You may not be at the you know times or moments or place that you love. But these are all learning experiences. Uh, keep an eye on on uh, what can come next, and uh, have faith and always want to give back uh, and contribute uh, and help. Because if nobody had helped you, you wouldn't be where you are. So I'll stop there maybe and, uh, you know, entertain some, uh, some discussions. Thank you so much on behalf of all attendees. I would like to sincerely thank you for uh, this uh, beautiful uh, uh, talk. Um, I would like to ask all attendees to write your questions in the uh, Q and a box. Please indicate where you come from uh, and what you do in life. I'll be reading the questions and Professor Nimmer will be answering the questions. I know that you are so busy and uh, thank you so much for giving us uh, this time. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. This is coming from Rita Serkis, who is currently uh, doing her PhD at uh, EPFL in Switzerland. I know Rita, I believe she is a graduate from uh, LAU, Lebanese American University. Her question and comment. Thanks a ton for this inspirational talk. How hard was it to shift fields from PhD to postdoc? Um, it was actually uh, quite hard <laughs> in the sense that uh, when you, I mean, it's, it was maybe harder on the morale <laughs> more than on like, like learning because, you know, you, you can actually, it's easier to learn biology from chemistry probably than the other way around. But um, I was, you know, well known already in chemistry. I had done, had great contributions and then I come in a field where nobody knows me, where I have to learn almost how to, you know, to, to do pipetting and have people show me how to do dissections and so on. And I remember going and uh, at one point and telling my, uh, my, my uh, postdoc supervisor, um, can you tell your, your student at least to show some respect for me? Because whenever something went wrong in the lab, they said, oh, it's the chemist, you know, who did it. And he turned to me and said, what do you want me to tell them to call you doctor? So I laughed and then I realized that actually, you know, you just have to prove yourself again to people. 
But um, importantly, you know, when I was going to the lectures, for example, in, 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 in molecular biology and so on, um, so I, I had just like had terrible headaches and had to go back and read on my own because the terminology was so different and everything. Nonetheless, this gave me this hypersensitivity of not using a lot of jargon when you're talking with scientists from another field, because this is such an impediment uh, to collaboration. So even that was just like very instrumental uh, in, in the pursuit of my career. So I would highly recommend it. It's hard at the beginning, but it's fantastic after. Thank you. Uh, this question is coming from Tufi Amrad. He is a chemistry undergraduate student here at AUB. Uh, he's asking, what can you tell us about your experience at AUB, your short experience at AUB, especially with Dr. Haddadin, if you still remember. By the way, Dr. Haddadin is my neighbor and I can hear him. He's in the office and he's watching your talk. I can see him. Well, and well, he's... well Professor Haddadin, hello. I, I mean, I just have so many fond memories and I have to say, I owe it to Professor Haddadin that I went into, uh, continued into chemistry and love organic chemistry because he taught it in such an amazing way. Like, look, I didn't want to do biology because I hate, hated having to memorize things. And many you know, people, many colleagues actually have told me that they hate organic chemistry because they had to memorize. But he didn't teach it this way. It was like an interesting puzzle and all these experiments and these you know, uh, electrons and, and, and everything moving around it was fascinating. In fact, I remember, you know, taking two courses, the second one during the summer um, uh, semester with a huge organic chemistry book, which I used to take with me to put under my, my head when I went to the beach of AUB during courses. So I had, I have very fond memories um, of AUB until, you know, about, I would say, the, the, the fall summer of 76 where I spent, uh, um, I think courses were suspended and we spent about two months in the sub-basement of the medical building. At the time I was living in Jewett Hall, uh, but uh, we, we were moved to the, to the basement. So, but even those days now in retrospect, um, you know, it allowed us to form better bonds uh, with, with, with uh, each other's and, uh, and you can, once you live certain hardship, then, you know, other things are not so hard in life anymore. Thank you. Uh, this question is coming from Rain Zankar. Uh, she is a biology student at AUB. Thank you for this amazing talk. I wanted to know what made you too interested in making the science available to the public? Well, this is, you know, an excellent question. Uh, I, I, I very, I feel very strongly about the importance uh, of science. Uh, and feel very strongly that if the public understood science better, I think it's 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 much better for the choices they 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 make. Not only the choices they make in terms of what they eat and and how they ca carry on their life, but also in how they um, they analyze what they're being told. Uh, the the disinformation, whether it's in science, in politics, in in in, in everything. Uh, I like to say that actually science is, is good for democracy uh, it, because it gives you that ability to uh, be objective, to analyze things, to question things, uh, and uh, to, um, uh, you know, when the, when the public understands science and demands it from their uh, leadership, uh, it keeps them on their toes. I can tell you in Canada during this pandemic, Every time the government, whether the federal government, provincial governments or others have um, made decisions about whether it's lockdown or about, um, you know, mask wearing, about vaccines or whatever, the public inevitably ask, what do the experts uh, say? We want to hear from the experts, not from the politicians. So. I, I just like feel it's so important and I would encourage everyone and certainly in Lebanon uh, to to really take on science literacy uh, as a major uh, responsibility and objective. I think it's in the best interest of the country and the world. 
And this question is uh, coming from Mrs. Soha Maidan. She is the Associate Vice President for Advancement and Events at AUB. Uh, as female leaders, we face pressure from both sexes. Can you please share the challenges you face dealing with competitors from both genders? Whoa, <laughs> that would take the entire day. <laughs> Uh, let me just say that I, I, I um, hear Dr. Haddadin laughing in the second room. <laughs> you know, it's um, I remember when when I first uh, took on the the position of uh, director of academic affairs at uh, at uh, the, uh, my institute in Montreal. Uh, one of my uh, male colleagues was you know very uh, who was a collaborator, a scientific collaborator. You know, was very uh, sort of upset with me, and and uh, you know, uh, like how are you making this decision? Why are you doing this? And I said, like, after it, it, I said, would you have talked to me like this if my name was not Mona, was for example John? And he paused and said, hmm, maybe not. So that was one of the easiest one, but. Uh, you know, being a fem one of the only females for for a long time in in uh, you know around the table, um, you know, at, at times I had to say, okay, I'm just gonna let go, but at other times I had to say, you know, this is just like not acceptable that you don't let me express myself, that you cut me off, um, that that you don't listen to what I have to say. Um, and you know th there were times where it, I just like had to to just like be tough uh, in a way, uh, and uh, people came came around to their credits sometimes after a year, saying, "Well, you know, okay, we we understand." There were some like um, uh, arm muscling that uh, was uh, was happening. Uh, so this is with the guys, um, and I, I'm, we're, I'm not out of the wood. I can assure you that <laughs> I, I still encounter this and ask questions sometimes. Like, would people talk to me like this, or would I have to repeat myself ten times before they listen? If I were a guy, um, with, with the woman, it's it's very different and and um, and complex because um, you know there are those who expect you to have different standards for them uh, because you're a woman. Uh, and if you don't, then they think that you're, you're betraying them. Um, and others who think that, uh, you know, you are where you are, not because of your competence, but because you're a woman and therefore they should be there too. So it's, I mean, again, it's, it's work in progress. Um, I like to preach by example. Um, it has virtues. Uh, it's not always satisfactory immediately because it takes time before people come around. Um, but it is what it is. Thank you. Uh, this question is coming from Wael Osman. Uh, he's a biology major, uh, majoring student at AUB. Thank you for sharing your inspiration and story. Would you have reached all these heights if you stayed in Lebanon? Does our country have the fertile soil for us to flourish? You know, this is this like in answering this, I, I am both sad and I have goosebumps because um, I, I know that I succeeded outside Lebanon. Um, I know that, you know, perhaps had I stayed in Lebanon, during, I mean, those times, I wouldn't have uh, succeeded like this. But there is absolutely no reason why now, you know, you, the young generation, the youth, the, the new people cannot succeed in Lebanon. Uh, I think that, um, you know, without like having a political speech here, um, I think that, that Lebanon, that there are so many opportunities I think that the country needs um, determined, um, I don't know what to say. I mean, the young generation needs to assert themselves and they need to do maybe things the way, you know, they wanna do it. They see it not necessarily the way it was done uh, throughout. 
um, I'm not saying that we should throw away our heritage and everything that we've done, but any place that doesn't reinvent itself, that doesn't change its way of doing business, even if it had been successful, is doomed to irrelevance. So, you know, I strongly believe that it can be done in Lebanon. I've tried throughout my career to, to maintain linkages, uh, to start things in, for, you know, with Lebanon, Professor Haddadin is well aware of the uh, Academy, Academy des Sciences du Liban that we started, and and it's really up to the to the Lebanese, I think, youth uh, to um, make of the country what they want to make of it, and I hope they want to make something good of it. This question is coming from George Deeb. He's a biomedical engineering PhD student at AUB. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, Dr. Nama. What is an important skill from PhD that was important for industry and vice versa? Yeah, well, when we think about, uh, about uh, our PhD, we think about the technical part of it. Uh, we think about what we've learned for engineering, for, for chemistry. By the way, congrats on biomedical engineering. I think it's, uh, it's not only the, it's the present and the future. It's a, it's a great field. Um, so what you learn and, and when you're doing your PhD is you learn problem solving. Uh, you learn to ask a question. You have a big problem. You have to distill it into questions. You ask a question, you make a hypothesis. Um, you have to go about it in an analytical manner, in a logical manner. You have to look at the evidence. You have to conclude when it doesn't, didn't work. You have to accept it and then adapt. Um, and uh, problem solving, uh, adaptability. Um, you know, the ability to, to be resilient, uh, to accept failure. These are things that the, the industry, the industry wants. One other thing, uh, when you're doing your PhD, you learn to work with others, certainly in, in the sciences and engineering, um, at, at many times you depend actually on others. So this is called, you know, teamwork as well. You have, you, you defend your thesis, you give talks. This is communication. You communicate to different audiences, not always to exactly your field. So when you ask employers, what do you want? This is what they want. They want people who can think, they want people who can who are adaptable, and they want people who are resilient, who can communicate with others and work with others. Hey, you've got the whole package. And this question is coming from Lina Diab. She is a biology undergraduate student. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. It was much needed. You mentioned that you should always be yourself. So how do you deal with the criticisms of others during your journey? Um, the way you deal, I mean, you, you can stop and think about it and, and it takes you down. And let me tell you that uh, at, at times and at the beginning, I was very affected. In fact, my first paper that was rejected and it was rejected from science, so it was a major journal after review. Some would see it already as a success. I was just so uh, put off that it took me months and you know months before I resubmitted it somewhere else. So um, you know, if you pay attention to, to criticism of your peers, of your society, and everything, it can be daunting and it can actually stop you from doing the things uh, that you want to do. I'm not saying that you should ignore criticism. Sometimes criticism uh, forces you to think, uh, to come up actually with better arguments uh, to defend what you're doing, uh, or to realize that what you're doing may not be the best. So I would say take it with a grain of salt, uh, but constructive criticism is essential uh, for, for growing up, uh, but negativism, uh, pulls you down and is, you know, you can certainly do without it and you should just like, uh, be impermeable to it and just carry on. Thank you. This question is from uh, Dr. Bernadette Mdawar. She is a psychiatry, uh, psychiatry chief resident at AUBNC. Thank you, professor, for sharing your inspiring experience with us. The several crises going on in Lebanon are adding extra burden on the Lebanese population but particularly Lebanese scientists and doctors talking about brain drain is becoming the norm. Looking at things back in the times when you left from Lebanon, 
things were maybe similar in terms of crisis. I wonder what kept you going on and pushed you forward? Well, uh, you know, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, now I'm worried that I'm be, uh, you know, I have a chief, uh, you know, resident psychiatry analyzing me and what I said. Please do email me confidentially your assessment. But uh, look, y y the, the times I was there were difficult, were very difficult. Uh, what, what, what kept us going was actually hope. And 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 um, you know thinking that look things cannot get worse, um, and then also when you, you can't do anything about it, you know thinking look at least I'm going to do my share like I'm gonna study um, as a scientist I'm gonna be able to help the country right now I can't do anything about it, so um, I don't know I'd have to reflect even more because like sometimes. I, I wonder now how how we you know kept going. Uh, th there were um, th there were times when when Shanik would stop and we would you know run out to, to get bread and others or even to classes and then uh, come back. Uh, so it's it's pretty daunting. Um, you know, to, so I understand the, the pressure now definitely in Lebanon, uh, like even a country like like Canada that is a, a bit, I think, uh, in better shape, at least economically, uh, everyone is suffering a great deal. I think that there needs to be, there needs to be uh, hope and, and uh, seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but in many ways, I think this is where people need to roll their sleeves and just like get involved and perhaps not wait for the light to shine, but get involved in putting it on. I don't know if it makes sense, and I feel you know bad and humble to 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 be giving any um, you know guidance on this because when I look at at the situation in Lebanon right now, both the sanitary and the economic situation, um, I, I'm just like profoundly profoundly sad and disappointed. Indeed. Um, this question is coming from uh, Sophie Tapman. She is a graduate student coming from Uganda. Uh, you addressed uh, this question in, uh, from a certain angle. Uh, her question is, what challenges did you encounter in your career being that you are a female? Perhaps uh, I can add to it, what was your biggest challenge as a female, as a woman? Sorry. Um, well, um... Like I said, you know, I didn't really think about it a lot until I started being in, in leadership positions. Um, when I was a graduate student, I, I guess I had grown to, uh, you know, not paying attention to the fact that, um, you know, I was one of the few women in the classroom or in the lab and, and so on, and just like did what I had to do. And uh, I owe so much to my, to my um, mother and father who raised us in Lebanon as equal, the girls and the boys, and uh, had actually higher expectations of, of the girls almost than, than of the boys, and certainly of me as the first in the family, the eldest in the family. Uh, it's really later on when, um, when there is more of a pecking order and that you're in a position uh, above your, or I mean, sort of, you know, above your colleagues administratively. Uh, that uh, that things start happening, and of course, it has to do a lot as well with with cultural norms. And uh, in a society like Canada, where there's a lot of diversity, um, you, you encounter more or less, depending also on the cultural experiences and background of your colleagues. Thank you. This question is coming from Dima Itani. Uh, a biology student at AUB, uh, thank you for this talk. How do you feel with society's pressure, especially pressures on women? Uh, perhaps I read uh, your recent interview uh, in, uh, um, I forgot the, the, the magazine's name, but you mentioned about how um, you revolted uh, in the high school when uh, you were not allowed to uh, go into science. Perhaps you can share that story with the audience. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's an interesting uh, story. Uh, I guess I was a, a 
little a bit revolutionary, certainly for the for the school uh, where I was, which is which is which was Zahrat Al Ahsan, a a great school that still exists in Lebanon. And every time when I go there, actually I go and uh, and and visit it. But it was an all girls uh, school, and um, uh, as you know, in uh, 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 Troisième, you have to make a decision whether you're going to do science or, or literature and others. And we had no, no choice. It was only um, the literary, literary uh, courses. So uh, I just like didn't accept that um, we didn't have a choice. Again, maybe on the topic of having your options open. Uh, I was very good in, in in math and in sciences as well. So I guess that uh, that helped. But I liked other fields too. So, but it was the question, the principle that because you're you're a girl, uh, you have to go in a path. And um, I convinced a number of my my friends. Actually, we were a handful uh, only. And that was another thing that I learned in life is that uh, you you need actually a very small number of similarly minded people to change things. Alone, you can't do it. But you don't need uh, the entire class. You need, you know, only a handful of people. And uh, we demanded uh, to have a, the, the option of, of science. Anyway, it was like a long uh, process. Uh, we almost went on, on strike for it, but we managed to, uh, to have a science, uh, the science option. Donc, uh, so the, the first year there was uh, a, a science uh, for girls at the school. We were 17. Uh, girls that went into into that field, and uh, it was a, a very interesting also moment for me because uh, it told me that uh, again you you can change things and you don't have to accept the status the status quo doesn't mean you have to be revolutionary all the time because some things are 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 just fine, but whatever you don't like you can do something about it. Uh, the interview I was referring to, it was in the national news. It was a, a very interesting uh, interview that your staff members, I take this opportunity to thank them. They uh, were very helpful uh, during the preparation for this talk. By the way, we have been working on this for two years, literally. My first invitation went to you two years ago, but we finally I, made it happen. I, 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 I wish I had, I had accepted it immediately, but you know, it was the beginning of my new role. Yeah. So uh, there was just like a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, demands on uh, on my time, and I was putting a demand on myself to learn my new job, to understand how government works, and so on. Because when you're outside something, and when you're inside, it's a completely different story. Well, thank you again. I know how busy you are. I, uh, we're stretching it a little bit. If you allow me, just uh, ten, twelve more minutes, and sure. uh, we will stay uh, within schedule. Uh, this question is coming from Noor Aqiki. Uh, as we know, in Lebanon, women are very much discriminated against and uh, told that engineering and STEM um, is for men. How can we fight these uh, false uh, preconceived ideas? Yeah, and and you know, it's uh, it is the case uh, even in um, in uh, in Canada, in in North America, in Europe as well. Um, women have made a lot of uh, strides in um, in sciences, but not in all fields of, of sciences. Uh, biology is much better than chemistry, which is better than physics, uh, which is better than engineering sometimes, uh, certain engineering, not others. Um, I think that whenever women are given the opportunity, um, they are excelling in, in these fields. I think that the, the the issue as well, and this is where an institution like the American University of Beirut um, can have a great impact, which is to um, maybe promote the different uh, the different field um, career options that uh, women have once they they do physics or math or engineering. Um, computer science, uh, for example, is is terrible, but is it how we portray? Uh, you know, the nerds in computer science, how we portray what computer science does that you're in a corner, you know, doing your, your thing. And maybe this is not appealing uh, to women. Um, is it uh, in engineering? Is it just like the way the milieu is? Is it, uh, um, you, you know, it's, it's, 
it's the society, but it's also the the milieu itself. And uh, I really think it's um, it's it's so important for women to uh, do all these different uh, fields. So it's in society's interest uh, that women have these opportunities, and this is why it has to be uh, really a societal effort where everybody um, does their share. And I think that institutions and great institutions like AUB really can play a great role uh, in how they advertise these fields and how they explain them on how they make sure that uh, the, the departments, the, the, the curriculum is actually welcoming to women. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Bernadette Mdawar, uh, rather than sending you her comment privately, the uh, psychiatry uh, resident, uh, chief resident, she wrote, just feeling humbled to listen to your impressive journey and learn from it with a smiling face or big laugh. Uh, now, the next question is coming from uh, Dr. Sahar Kuber. She is a nephrologist at AUBMC. And her question is, where do you belong, Canada or Lebanon? Well, um, I belong to both. I don't think that we need to be uh, to to belong to only one place. I think this is, you know, a, a, perhaps a vision of the past. Um, and this is what I love about Canada. Uh, Canada embraces diversity. Um, I, I never hit the fact that I am, um, you know, Lebanese, that I'm, of, uh, you know, born and, and raised in, in Lebanon. Uh, when the prime minister announced my appointment uh, uh, in uh, on the floor of uh, of parliament of the Canadian Parliament, he did say that I was coming from Lebanon, that I was from Lebanon, and it's viewed as as uh, you know a richness. So uh, so there you have it. I'm uh, I'm different from a Canadian who's of Italian origin. I'm different from a Canadian who's of Irish origin or of French origin. But uh, Lebanon is my my uh, um, you know uh, birthplace, and uh, I you, you can't just uh, you know forget that uh, it shaped me. Uh, I grew up there. Um, I'm proud uh, of of uh, my Lebanese heritage. I'm not always proud of my birthplace uh, when I look at what's going on, but uh, but I'm I'm proud to say that uh, I'm both Lebanese and Canadian. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, coming from Sana Mansour. She is an undergraduate psychology student at AUB. Um, so her question is, what advice would you give to undergraduate students that are looking for inspiration on the career path uh, we should take? Well, you, you know, uh, you guys now are very lucky because you have the internet. Uh, you can uh, you can do searches. You can. Uh, uh, you can listen to, uh, uh, you know, um, um, mentoring talks from all over the world. You can see uh, different role models, uh, which certainly wasn't the case, of course, for us. Uh, um, I, I, you know, when uh, to do com to do the uh, co my computer science class was actually Fortran, and I and we were and I can't remember which room in, uh, in at AUB with a huge machine and printing all these cards and so on. So. These are, and you know, I certainly didn't have a role model in, in the US or in Europe or anywhere. Um, my role model, um, a, a famous uh, female biologist, uh, Nicole Ledoira, is French. Uh, I met her uh, accidentally when she came to give a talk, uh, and we remained in touch, uh, um, you know, sometimes during uh, visits, other times, uh, you know, virtually and, and otherwise. So I think that uh, you know I would say reach out. Uh, don't limit yourself to what's in your immediate physical uh, surroundings. Um, ask questions. Whenever a um, um, a, a, a girl or a, a, a man, a woman or a, a man, reach out to me uh, to ask me question about career uh, path. I answer actually. I'm, I, I'm 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 flattered that they would turn to me. So. Uh, don't think that you can't uh, approach anybody in, in life, approach whoever you want. The worst that, that can happen is they will not answer, but they might. They may very well might. Thank you. 
Uh, this question is coming from Dunya Jalul, a UB graduate alumni and incoming neuroscience PhD student at MD Anderson in Houston. Uh, incredible journey, Professor. What are your thoughts on the state of academia in our times? A lot of fresh, uh, of fresh researchers suffer this illusionism, especially with the rise of publish or perish mentality, mentality that damages science quality and public safety. Look, there, there is, uh, f first of all, you know, you're in a great institution and in a great field. So, uh, you know, <laughs> congratulations. Um, there is no question that, um, you know, there, there, there are things that are not necessarily um, positive in, in, uh, in the competitive spirit and in, in the competition. Uh, I, I think that we are set for a... Um, I would say reset in a, in a way because many uh, people don't like uh, what they're living and what they've you know been through. I think that the pandemic there's going to be pre and post pandemic, and we're going to see things different. Uh, and um, I think that um, academic uh, life, uh, universities, research uh, are going to change uh, after the the pandemic. Uh, this being said, I, I will say that it's uh, it's great when you publish great papers. Uh, with open science now, it doesn't really matter the impact factor. I know there's a lot of pressure on the impact factor, so it's the impact really of your work and how how it's cited and the the influence it has, not where it's published. Uh, and um, um, I, I I know this for a fact because I'm involved in the open science in Canada and um, you know collaborate with the with the U.S. Um, and the European leadership on it. We are going to have to change um, some of our metrics uh, in academia in terms of promotions, uh, in terms of even the granting agencies uh, of what counts as success and what counts as impact. So. I would just say focus on the important things, focus on doing good science, focus on the learning experience. Um, if you have a great discovery during your PhD is great. If you don't, uh, you would have learned nonetheless uh, how to think, how to go about solving a problem, and you'll have lots of time ahead of you to do a lot of great things. Three more questions, I promise. This question is coming from Sami Awadallah. He's a medical student at the Charles University in Prague. Uh, how is funding for science research nowadays? Is it competitive to get funding for less mainstream scientific experiments? Well, you know, f funding is competitive everywhere. Uh, and uh, there are ups and downs. Um, we just had a budget on Monday. Uh, there were... Um, I don't know, just for uh, for life sciences, there were about $2 billion. And uh, the researchers in Canada are not happy because there wasn't enough money for basic uh, research. And there were, you know, uh, half a billion for quantum uh, and half a billion for artificial intelligence and so on. So I say this because, uh, you know, money is always a, a, an object and, uh, uh, but money is not everything. Uh, so, um, I think that increasingly people are also seeing that um, some competition is good, keeps you, you know, sharp and on your edge, uh, but we also want to promote collaboration. And a lot of the new newer programs actually um, look for uh, collaborations, for, for teams, for multidisciplinary approaches. Um, so, I would encourage also everyone to... Uh, to look into multidisciplinary collaborations because I think this is anyway what we need to solve uh, complex problems. Look at what we needed during the pandemic, and look what we're going to need to to solve the the, the problem of sustainable development and climate change. Thank you. This question is coming from Celine Rabai. I'm an undergraduate pre-med biology student at UB. Thank you so much for reminding us of all the possibilities and. Uh, uh, ephemeral aspect of limitations. How were you able to continue even when everyone around you thought you failed? 
Well, uh, well, first of all, uh, I had people who supported me. <laughs> Certainly, my, my my family was was very supportive of uh, my choices, and uh, you know, some of my colleagues in their ways were supportive, uh, but they were thinking like, oh well, you know, she has this idea in her head. Let her do it, and she'll come around. Sometimes I came around, others I didn't come around. So, but all this to say that there were people who were supportive. Um, I think at, at times um, it, it wasn't about being uh, stubborn, but just like really being adventurous, wanting to explore different things. Um, so, uh, and in a way, knowing that I could always go back and do what I know how to do or what others expect me to do. So I think that you, do, you really need to build this confidence. And I will say very candidly that um, women are not as good at, at this as, um, as uh, guys. Um, very often uh, when I wanted to, you know, as, as vice president research, when I wanted to nominate women for prizes and uh, so on, uh, I would approach them and say, please give, I just need your CV. I want to nominate you for a prize for nomination to an academy. And they would say, no, 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 I'm not ready. You know, next year's gonna be better and so on. I can assure you not a single guy. I asked them for their CV to be nominated to, to something said this. Uh, in fact, probably less than 24 hours later, I had the, the CV. I had a summary of accomplishments of everything. So, okay, between, you know, uh, too little and too much, there's a just milieu. Uh, and I would just say that, uh, you know, we need to be confident uh, in what we're able to to accomplish, and uh, um, and I think that that keeps us uh, going. And uh, success breeds success. So people say, uh, oh, you have to find something to you're passionate about, and then otherwise you don't succeed. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and I think when we say this, we put a lot of pressure on young people because they don't know. I certainly didn't know. I had a vague idea of what I wanted to know to do, but not a path. Uh, but you know what? Once you're successful at something, you like it because it's giving you success. And then you just like do more of it. And it's like a very good positive feedback loop. There are so many questions, but I promise that this is the last question. Uh, I know we still have three minutes of your time. Uh, this question is coming from Samia Mohtar. She is a biomedical engineer. Uh, her question is, now that you are in government, uh, how do you feel about politics affecting innovation? Um, how do you see your role in pushing towards science and government decision making? This is a great, a great question, you know, because uh, again, when we talk about career in, in science, I think that we need to have scientists uh, at, in, at all levels of government, um, both in the um, inside government and in the, in the bureaucracy, if you want, or the civil service, uh, and also politicians, because I, I think they, you know, science is after all evidence, it's objectivity. And uh, this is uh, so important. So what, uh, of course, I've uh, I've seen is that uh, uh, it's uh, it's really important to be promoting science, but also to be explaining uh, science. And you know, there is like a, a discours de sourd in French, we would say, uh, between uh, policy and and science, because uh, you need to know what question to ask of a scientist. Uh, so. And I give, you know, the, the example all the time, like at one point during the pandemic, when there was the whole debate, do we close the border? Do we, you know, not close the, the, the borders or the airports? And then people would ask me, well, what, what does science say? And I would answer, science doesn't tell you whether you should close the borders or not. Science tells you how the, uh, how infection is, is, uh, is propagated, how it's transmitted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And based on that, then you can make decisions. You can actually input this in a risk matters and decide what is it that you want to do. So I think it's critical to have uh, people who understand uh, science who can translate it also to 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 policy and uh, and to politics. And um, I think like in everything in life, homogeneity is not good. 
So I don't think that um, we need to have only people from political sciences and from law fields uh, or international development that are in, in politics. I think that scientists and engineers and physicians have a lot to contribute and, uh, and we certainly you know, can see it every time we have more uh, diversity in any place, whether it's around the boardroom or around the political table, uh, you know, the cabinet and so on. So. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, all attendees, I would like to sincerely thank you for uh, this beautiful, inspiring mentoring talk. Uh, I look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully here in Beirut uh, soon. And hopefully the situation will get better soon. I want to show you that uh, I, uh, on my wall now, I have your poster. Um, so I, I put the posters of all those who are giving the mentoring talks. So you are, uh, you just gave the 19th mentoring talk and your picture uh, um, will be on the wall as long as I am here at AUB, hopefully for a long time. Once again, I would like to thank you for uh, your precious time and uh, until we meet, thank you again. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, and and I hope that Masa Watilu wish you la Professor Haddadin. He said no. I hear him. He said no. <laughs> He's proud of you. Thank you so much. You have a great evening, and thank you everybody thank for you. attending. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions as well. Thank you everybody. You have a good night. Bye bye. bye, -bye.